I don't know if you remember this. It's a model I made of the Archimedes drive. And in there is this. This is a cross roller bearing in a ring cage that takes the axial load and the thrust load of the actual model. And it does that for absolutely anything. Now using rollers instead of balls is, I think, really good for 3D printing because rollers print much better than balls. Try to print a ball, you'll have a whole load of, well, support structure really that takes a lot of cleaning off. And the smaller they get, the worse that is because you can't really get to them without a lot of work. And this works really well as an ideal bearing, according to me, for 3D printing. But it does something else as well. It doesn't have a center. Now, I really wished I'd known about this or thought about this when I made this thing. This thing is my RQ sort of tube wind turbine. The idea is the wind is funneled into the centre and spins it. And of course I did that with the central axis. And there's the central axis right there. And in this housing are some support bearings to keep the cylinder turning nice and cylindrically so that we can put magnets and coils and generate from that. Because what that represents is a huge obstruction to wind flow. If I'd put one of those in, I don't know what kind of efficiency improvement I would get, but I would get an improvement in this kind of wind turbine, certainly. So there's a whole load of really good uses for this from, well, turntables, wind turbines, motors and drives. And I didn't really go into exactly how I made this. Because as you know, if you know how to make something, but you can make it to any size you want for any project you want rather than having to fish around on Thingiverse and find something approximating what you want. So we're going to go into exactly how that was made so that you can have a bearing set that you can use for, well, a whole range of projects. Right, to do this I've opened up a new work plane in Tinkercad. I've put the ruler on the corner and you can see I've pulled a box primitive onto the work plane because to do this what we're going to do is use our friend SVG Rotate. So you go to the search shapes, click it, type in SVG and it will pull up something called SVG Revolver. We pull the revolver down onto the work plane and what it's going to ask for is a file to work from. So we need to create the SVG file and for that we use the box. Click on the box and export it, but when you export it, export it as SVG and it will create that file for you. What we then need to do, obviously, is go to where that file is and usually it's in your downloads menu, uh, your downloads folder, I apologise. Once you've found it in your downloads folder, click and hold and drag it into the SVG Rotate box and it will apply that box to SVG Rotate. Now, what the race actually is, is basically a box turned on its side. So we need to rotate that sketch by 45 degrees, and that will rotate it on its side to create as a diamond that we can see there. Now we want to make that diamond close, and you see the revolve angle is 300, change that to 360, and we'll get ourselves a closed circle. Now here are the, some of the curious things about SVG Revolver. You'll see that the sketch height is sector 5 and the inside diameter, diameter maximum is 20. So we're going to have to do something else to get bigger sizes. I work with things that are, are easy. So I'm aiming for something that's about 220 millimeters across and I'm working with something at about 20 millimeters across. So I'm going to need in, to increase its size by a thousand percent. And this is where I'm noticing the sketch height comes in. If we decrease the sketch height to one, and we have a look at that, we'll see it's one millimeter high and 22 millimeters across either side. So if I increase that by a thousand percent, what I'll get is a raised uh, depth of 10. And I'll get a 220 raised diameter, which is more what I want for a kind of uh, turntable maybe, or something like that. You'll see the number of sides is actually quite low, it's 24, so we slide up the number of sides to make ourselves a smoother race bearing, and then we can export that, and we export that as an STL. And then quite promptly what you do when you've exported it is re-import it, but this time at a thousand percent. So we import the file, set it to a thousand percent and click import, and what we'll get is a massive race bearing. We shrink that down a little bit, you can see how big it suddenly got. Now we don't need the box anymore, so we can delete that, and we don't need our little test ring anymore, so we can delete that. 
Now, if we click on our new ring, we'll see that, in fact, it is 220 and it's 10 high. We want to surround that this is going to be in because this is going to be a cutout. So we make that a hole. Res it from the ground, say, three millimeters. And we need to create the cutout that this is going to be. Now, it's 220 and I want 30 millimeters all the way around. So what we now need is another cylinder. Smooth it out. And we want it to be 16. If we make it 16 high, that'll be 10 for the height of the race that we've created. Three for the bottom, three for the top. This has already moved up three. So we've got a nice measurement that will actually enclose that completely because that's what we're looking to enclose it by. Now it's 220, so we want 226 by 226. And that will enclose our cutout completely because it will leave a solid center, which we don't want. So what we need is another cylinder, but this time as a hole. So just copy that, make it a hole. 226 will get rid of this whole thing. We want it on the inside diameter, which is 200. And again, we want three other sides, so less six. So we make that 194 by 194. Then we can align all of this to the same center, and then we can group them. Now, it looks like we've got a solid ring. But if we make the ring a hole so we can see through it, we'll see that there's a cutout in there, which is actually the rest that we're going to want. So let's turn that back to a solid. Now, we want two at exactly the same size. Remember, it's 16 high. So if we take ourselves yet another cylinder, and this time again, a cylinder hole, smooth it out. This is 226. So let's make that a little bit bigger so we make sure we don't get any artifacts. Make it 230 by 230. And that will cover the entirety of this if we were to cut it out. Because if we cut it out, we'll cut the whole thing out. So we need to raise that about halfway. Now, halfway is eight. If I were to do that now, then I would get two racers identical cut through at eight millimeters. Because what I want to do is add a four millimeter ring in there that is going to be a cage for the rollers. Because it's four millimeters, I need to take two millimeters off and I need a little bit of three free play. So what we need to do is lower that by two millimeters, six, and then a little bit of three play, free play. So call it 5.75. If we lower that by 5.75, then we'll get the bottom half. Let's just align those and then group them and we have our bottom half race now we need to print two of those out print off two of those identical rings they're going to go on top of each other like that and that is our race way made now we need the cage now to make the cage we start with a cylinder four millimeters high by 228 by 228 remember this was 226 i quite like leaving overlaps and leeway but you can trim this down to suit yourself if you want tighter fits on things i've given it an extra millimeter all the way around just to make sure everything works nicely and of course we need to cut a hole in that because we only want it to go in a little bit here and again a millimeter if you remember, this inner of the thing that we've moved out of the way was 196. So I've made this 194, uh, sorry, 194. I've made this 192 by 192. And again, we just center those two to create our cage ring. Now we've created that, of course, we need our roller cylinder. And our roller cylinder is going to be 10 by 10 by 10 because the chase that we cut was 10 by 10 by 10. Now, again, you can play around with tolerances and clearances on this and maybe make it 9.8 or whatever it is that you want to make it. I'm making mine 10 by 10 by 10. And I need to use that as a cutout in the ring so that we can actually get a slot that this thing will, can go into. And rollers, remember, are set at a 45 degree angle, and that's because we made that diamond pattern. So we make that a hole. Now what we need to do is align it to our cage. So I highlight both of them and align it to the cage. You align it to the center and then one edge. And that means that that is right at the edge of that cylinder, which we don't want. Of course, we made it a millimeter too big. So setting the snap grid at one millimeter, use the arrow key to move it a millimeter. Now, if we align this to the center of that ring, so we align it here as well, then it will sink down so that the peak of the cylinder, the roller that we're going to have, is at the center of the trench that we just dug in the other ring. Of course, we need to be able to get that in there. Get that in there, we need to have a snap fitting, and so this has to open a little bit. 
To do that, we create a slot in it. So pull down another cube primitive. A lot of this is only primitives upon primitives. Make it two millimeters wide and again, align it to the outer ring cage that we we're just making. By zooming in, we can see that's well out. It's cutting all the way through and we don't want it to cut all the way through. So use the arrow key and bring it back. So it just cuts into this section here where the cylinder is going to go. Now, if we group those, we'll get what we're looking for, where we can snap fit a roller into that space because it's got a little gap here. Now we need to copy that and put it out of the way for a minute. It'll become clear in a minute why we've done that. Move it out of the way. Make sure that you can see all of this. Right, having moved that out of the way, what we need to do is ungroup it. We ungroup it so you can see everything. Now we need to work out how many of these cylinders that we're going to need to put in here. It's easy enough to work out. All you actually do is hit the cylinder, copy it, hold down the shift key and click the ring, and you'll get this arrow here. We can move that arrow around, and once we get to about eight degrees, we can see that we're actually clear of the other cylinder. So it's gonna be about eight degrees apart. But if I divide 360 by 8, I don't get a whole number, which will be the number of cylinders. I get 22.5. If I double that, if I take that up to 9, though, what I'll get is 20 cylinders to fit that space. Now, of course, we need to reverse those cylinders. So what we're going to need to do is move it 18 degrees to leave us the space for the cylinder. So it will actually be placed at 18 degrees. So let's just delete that and do this whole thing again. Now we know how many we want and what the angle is. We can highlight the whole thing. We can copy it and then we'll get this arrow. If you click on that arrow, you're able to type directly into the degrees 18 and it'll move it 18 degrees. Now we'll repeat that 20 times and we get to that. Highlight the whole lot and group it. Once it's grouped, just move it out of the way and let's bring this other one that we copied into play. Now we ungroup that. Click on this. This cylinder is facing the wrong way. We want the reverse of this. So once we're clicked on the cylinder, all we have to do is click this mirror key right there and you get these mirroring arrows. If we mirror it that way, it'll be in the right position and it'll be facing the right way. And we can repeat the same steps to get a ring with the opposite way around facing cylinders. When we've got that, what we need to do next is rotate that by nine degrees. Because if you remember, we'd rotated the whole thing by 18, we doubled it, and now we want to fill in those blanks. So rotate it by nine degrees, and then line it up with this other ring, and we get that. If you click somewhere in this looking wine glass looking thing, we can delete the other ring because we don't necessarily want duplication, and that's what we get. Highlight the whole thing, Group it, and that's what we get, and we're now ready to print off our cage. And there's our cage. Now, of course, we need rollers. These rollers are 9.8 by 9.8 by 9.8. Remember, this was 10 by 10 by 10. Now, that's a habit of mine to leave that kind of clearance because it's 3D printing, and there's a whole range of 3D printers out there, and I want people to be able to print it on whatever printer they've got. If you've got a, a more accurate printer and don't like the amount of clearance that I'm leaving, by all means change it. Do 9.95 if you like. Leave a little bit, but do whatever you like with these things. And of course you're able to print off this now in any number of you want. Now to fit these rollers, then the slots look like little wine glasses. There's a little lip right there. You feed the roller in from behind so that it hits the little lip. And then you twist it with the spring, because underneath the spring, there's another little lip. So you give it a twist until it snaps into place. So I should mention, there's another way to do this, a, a roller alignment. First of all, get your roller tilted to 45 degrees and your race, and then align the two to the race at the centre and the edge. Then what you do is you make the race a hole. 
Now if we zoom down onto that roller by clicking it and using the zoom down button, we can see where the roller actually is. And we can see here that it's too far down. And it would be because it's got to be three up from the bottom, remember. So when we tilted it, it went below the plane. Now we press three, it'll raise it the right level above the plane. And we can look at that and see where it actually is. And it's pretty obvious that that grade bit there is sunk in and we've got a gap there. So with your snap grid at one, just press it once and it will move into the position that it's supposed to be in. And we can see there's no, no grade bits and no gaps, which is exactly what we want. If we zoom back out to home, then we've got the cage already. And this time we first align the cage to the race. And then we align the cage to the center of the roller. So highlight the cage, highlight the roller, hit the align tool, and you'll see these three dots, and that aligns it to the center of the actual roller. And there we go. It's now nicely aligned. Of course, we need to make that not a hole anymore. And then we can proceed as we did before. So when we've got them in, we drop that onto the bottom, and of course we put the top of <laughs> what we have is a massive ring bearing. Now these are surprisingly strong. Now this was only printed with a 25% infill. Okay, we've got the bearing on the floor, and I've put a sheet of one centimeter acrylic on it, and we're gonna see if it can take my weight. Well, that bit worked, it's not breaking. Well, how about that? No, I'm not sure how much I weigh, but a good 11 or 12 stone, and this thing survived it no problem at all, no damage to it. Now, you could print it with 100% infill if you wanted it a bit more, if you were a bit more worried about it breaking when you'd step on it, but certainly that can carry an awful lot of weight, and it, as I say, works in thrust, that when it was flat it was thrusting, it works in axial loads, and it works in radial loads, so it's a brilliant bearing, and clearly pretty strong, and works quite nicely from 3D printing, and I think I've got a whole host of uses for this, not least improving the efficiency of that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, I hope it's helpful to you, thank you very much for watching, and please do remember to like and subscribe.